Welcome to Lancefield on the Line. My name is David Lancefield and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Katie Milkman, an award-winning professor, the James G. Deenan Professor at the Wharton School, the host of the podcast Choiceology by Charles Schwab, and a world-renowned behavioural scientist. You're also the co-director of the Behaviour Change for Good initiative with Angela Duckworth. And indeed, you work with startups to corporates, including Google and Morningstar and various others. So you are about changing behaviours for good, whether that's changing aspects of your lifestyle, saving more, doing more exercise and various other aspects. We're going to talk about that today. And you are the author of the book, How to Change, the science of getting from where you are to where you want to be. Congratulations on your new book. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm excited to and, be here. <laughs> indeed. And I was, I was looking through the, um, the quotes and it really is a who's who in the world of academia and business. Um, Richard Thaler, the Nobel Prize winning economist, described you as a wonder. That's quite <laughs> something in his review of the book. And indeed, Angela described you as in some ways, in many ways, not some ways, in many ways, the smartest person she's ever met. So you are most welcome and I'm very humble in your company. Um, so welcome, Katie. We're going to have a good conversation today. We are going to talk about, obviously, the book, your research, the world of academia, and maybe a little bit about you too. So uh, from, the, from the big picture to, to you as an individual. Um, let's just get straight to the book then. So how to change. There are quite a lot of books out there, right, on how to change in different shapes and form. I'm sure yours is the best. Well, I read it, so I know it is really good. But <laughs> you know, who is it for? Right. And why should somebody read it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I hope it's for literally everyone because we all have something that we'd like to do better uh, at, whether it's at work or at home or uh, someone we know who we're trying to coach or manage to be more effective. And the book is really about strategies that can help us achieve those goals, whether they're in our own lives or helping other people achieve them uh, at work. Hmm. Okay. I mean, you, you talk about this sort of tackling your adversary, if you like, when you're trying to do that, right? Which I like that sort of slightly combative sort of mindset. Um, and it sounds, when I, when I was reading the book, uh, it sounds very sensible, intuitive. That, by the way, doesn't mean I do all the, all the habits or practice the habits you describe. But what, you know, why, if, that, if it sounds intuitive, what are some of the big stumbling blocks that really get in the way? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think um, one big stumbling block is that we have, and actually, you know, Angela, I think would be the first to talk about this. We have this sense that there's something um, really fabulous about being gritty. There is something really fabulous about being gritty and about persevering, um, pushing harder, just do it as Nike would tell you. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the stumbling blocks, a lot of what we found is that that kind of a strategy that assumes we can just push through whatever challenge we face uh, yeah. ignores human nature and ignores the things that get in our way that trip us up. And, and if we have that narrow view and think, you know, I can just work harder, we won't set ourselves up for success strategically because we won't recognize what are the stumbling blocks and, and take the steps needed to make sure we won't stumble. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, of course, really what the book is all about. What are the things that might get in your way that you should anticipate and be sophisticated about and, and here are all these science-based strategies that can help mm. you ensure you don't stumble. Yeah, and that, I'm just thinking right now, um, you just prompted a thought, as a lot of people who are you know, tired, bored, exhausted for different reasons, whether that's being on calls like this and you know, Zoom calls or caring for people or actually had obviously illnesses, how resilient, if you like, are these strategies to the condition of the, of the people? Are yeah, you know, a, are they, do they have question. to be fit and great and so on, or actually do they still work with, for, for people right now? No, the, the, I mean, that's sort of the beauty is there's an assumption that we, and, and it, even whether you're tired or not, whether you, you, you know, have been through a lot or not, we're all human. We all have these challenges. It's just to greater or lesser degrees. And, and the strategies that I talk about should be helpful to anyone, whether they're struggling with these issues just a little bit, you know, whether procrastination is an itch that you scratch a lot or a little, yeah. um, whether or not, right, you have big challenges with confidence or small challenges with confidence, um, whether or not getting started feels like going up a mountain or like going up a hill, uh, it should be helpful. So you've listed there three of the seven factors that you described. I have read the book um, and I was reading it thinking this was like a biography of me, but no, it's not about me. It's not about me. Some of the issues. Um, it is about you. About, <laughs> of course it is. Well, it's about the reader. No, yes, that's the point. It's totally about the reader. So yeah. Yeah. But um, if you like, 
I'm sure you're fascinated with all of them, and I know you are. But if you had to pick one where you thought, you know what, that's the one that I, and this is a professional context, we might come to the personal later, but freshly you thought, that's the most intriguing factor that I've researched and looked at, which one would it be? Oh gosh, that's so hard, like picking which of your children is your favorite. Although I only have one, so it's not so hard for me, but <laughs> um, but I hear it's a really hard choice. There's a movie about that even. Um, okay, so if I have to pick, um, I would probably say that it's Temptation. Uh, I think Temptation is perhaps the the biggest challenge of the seven that I that I write about and the one that has the most straightforward and yet often ignored solution so like there's a big opportunity there to get that right mm. um and i'm happy to talk about that a little yeah, let's bit let's, let's drill do. down so you talked about strategies let's let's talk now a little bit about say so come on give us some answers go on yeah <laughs> i'm happy to um okay so temptation right is uh economists often use the term present bias if we're going to get nerdy to talk about it mm. it's this tendency we have to put off doing what's good for us uh, until the future, you know, like next week I'll diet, next week I'll focus on this report that's due for work. But today I have, you know, yummy food to eat and video games to play and, and other priorities. And, and we just do that in a loop until, <laughs> until we don't get our things done. And so um, it's a big challenge temptation gets in the way of our goals. But what I wrote about in the book is a strategy that I think is, is much too often overlooked, which is simply um, flipping it on its head, figuring out instead of just trying to sort of push through when you face a challenge, finding ways to actually make the thing you need to do, the thing you should do, the thing that's good for you in the long run, tempting. So yeah. how can you actually make it fun? And um, there's a bunch of different strategies. Let me tell you, talk about a couple. So first, I want to talk about research by Ayelet Fishbach and Caitlin Woolley, who I admire immensely. Um, they've done work showing that when asked, how do you plan to pursue your goals? Do you plan to just go for the most effective strategy or the strategy you think will, you'll enjoy most? Most people say, I'm going for effectiveness. That's why I have the goal. <laughs> I go for the effective thing. Um, but when you actually look at what works better, people who find a fun way to pursue their goals. So uh, say choosing the exercise at the gym that they enjoy most rather than the one that's most effective for burning right. calories right. or uh, choosing the food that they enjoy most that's that's healthy from a healthy set as opposed to the one that um, you know they think will be the most effective for their weight loss goals whichever um, you look at it's better to focus on the fun because you're going to persist longer right so and it's about persistence and sustaining it Absolutely right. It might work once. You might have a better workout session once where you burn more calories with that more effective strategy, but you're never coming back. So uh, I think this is a really, really important insight that we should appreciate more that if we don't find ways to do things that are enjoyable, we're not going to persist. Um, and I, I struggled with this in my own life around exercise as a graduate student it actually led me to develop a strategy that I've since studied and, and also, of course, used that I call temptation bundling, which is related to the insight I just described. I um, found that at the end of a long day, I, I just couldn't motivate myself to go to the gym. But what right. I really wanted to do was indulge in tempting uh, entertainment, like, you know, binge watch TV shows. I also I am a big um, novel, fan of, of page turner novels. And that's what I wanted to do. But that wasn't good. I should have been focused on work. I was a graduate student at the time. And so I found this solution that worked for me. I only let myself, and I, I really liked audiobooks. I only let myself listen to tempting audio novels. That turned that turned out to be my guilty pleasure um, <laughs> while exercising. That that filled the need I had for that um, indulgent, tempting bit of entertainment each day, uh, and it made the gym fun. And it kept me coming back. And I've done research showing that that bundling two things like this can be so yeah. super effective. Uh, and it's not just exercise, right? That's one example, but you yeah, can yeah. do it um, with lots of different things. So anyway, that, that's one deep dive into it. No, that's fa absolutely fascinating. I like that, that sort of bundling. I have to say, listening to audio books compared to some of the other temptations, I mean, it's not too racy, but go on, let, you, you, started, you started talking about yourself as a graduate student. You're now a fully fledged tenured professor with a big title. Um, what do you struggle with? And how do you overcome it? Oh, so many things. I knew you were going to ask that. And I was like, oh, no, how do I pick? Um, really? Uh, <laughs> yes. But I mean, that's I, 
a lot of it's part of why I wrote the book part of why I find this interesting at some level it's it's me search in addition to being research because I I identify with these challenges but I also have found that a lot of the challenges can be overcome um, and outsmarted and so that's that's what I find so exciting about mm. about the tools that I study um, mm. but I still struggle with these things and have to figure out how do I deal with it um, a few examples can I give you a few instead of just absolutely one? answer the question then go on <laughs> Um, I spend too much time on social media when I should be paying attention to my family. So I, you know, have strive, like leave the phone in a different room so that I'm right. not going to pick it up in the middle right. of dinner. Uh, for instance, I, if it's nearby, I'm sure to check and see if, you know, someone liked my latest tweet. Yeah, or, we all you know, do that, what, right? What's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the ranking of the book on Amazon right now? You know, what? pick your poison. Um, I also think I have too short of a temper, um, particularly with my son. And, uh, and that's something I struggle with trying to figure out like you know how to keep cool and and even when he's trying to push my buttons and that's that's a behavior I'd like to change is to be a calmer better parent mm. um so those are a couple yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll how about if I start there there's many no, more that's, but that's yeah, yeah. Start. One, thing I, one thing I appreciate about you and we, you know this is the first time we've spoken is for somebody so genuinely successful in any measure you are very open about some of your you know, whether you call them failings or challenges, and you're very generous also with other, you know, other academics. And I know some people are, but you, you know, you, you cite, you just having this, this conversation, you cite other people, you, you, you want other people to be, to be recognized, which I, I just call that out. I think that's very refreshing. That's right. And that's not, not always the Thank case you. in people who have got to a certain level. But before I spare your, I'll spare your blushes. Um, I want to go <laughs> I'm, back. I'm glad the lighting is bad in my walk-in closet where we're, we're getting the good audio because no, you can't I mean, see me turning red. <laughs> no, but I mean that sincerely. I mean that sincerely. That comes through. That comes through very much. But let's just flip from the personal, if you like, back to the corporate world just for a moment. You work with companies from time to time. Um, and companies are, you know, some companies are trying to change for the better now whether that's in terms of inclusion and a greater sense of belonging, a greater sense of profit and purpose in a world of re responsible capitalism. They're trying. Some are making headway, but it takes a long time. If you were speaking with a CEO of a, of a company that gets it, has, has bought your book, read your book, what would be the sort of overall message or what maybe, if that's a general point, or maybe something specific you'd say to her or him, actually, you know what, based on my book, I think you should do x yeah that's a great that's a great question um okay i have two answers the first is and i think we've already sort of touched on this but the first is i would i would try to sell them or convince them that science is going to be a lot more effective if they're already bought into it if they try to tailor the the nudges and strategies they use to help encourage employees to move in positive directions if they figure mm. out what's the barrier in each case rather than just trying to use a blanket strategy right uh, yes. to solve problems so that that's one this tailoring this tailored approach i think is really important and underappreciated mm. so many organizations and individuals sort of want to go to like the grab bag of tricks and just take out the one that looks shiniest and mm. it really depends if it you know you have to understand like why why are we having this challenge why aren't um why aren't we seeing more successful mentoring happening in the, in the company? Why aren't we actually people delve into vaccines? the problem more before reaching for the solution? Exactly. And understand mm. what, what's the block, what's the blockade, what's going on. And then, and then tailor um, the solution to that. So that's one. And yeah. then thing two is actually, I do think there's one, in spite of what I just said, which is like, you know, figure out what your problem is. There's one thing that's fairly universal. If you're trying to encourage change that's in the book and that's really the, the first chapter I write is about work I've done on the power of fresh starts. And this is yes. work I've done um, with my former student, Heng Chen Dai, now a professor at UCLA, um, and Jason Reese. We worked together on this project um, and it really, it grew out of a conversation I had with a leader at Google, just like the one you described where I got the question, when is the right time for us to promote change in our employees? Is there some ideal time? And yes. it was such an intriguing question. I didn't know the answer and I couldn't think of, of research that, that addressed it. But anyone who's thinking about change probably needs to know, is there a good launch point? <laughs> Particularly if they're an organizational leader thinking of trying to create change in their organization. And what we found in our work and what I've learned from you know, reading a whole lot of other people's work as well, is that there are moments when we're more motivated to change and those moments align with, with new beginnings. So it can be as small as a, 
a new beginning on the calendar. So the start of a new week or month, um, yeah. year's a big one. We know people make New Year's resolutions, celebration of a birthday, moments that feel like the start of a new era in our lives motivate us to think big mm. picture and feel disconnected from past failures and more optimistic. Um, but then moments that are actual transition points also give us that sort of clean yes. slate, optimistic feeling. So someone gets a promotion, uh, moves to a new office uh, or literally a new home. Uh, they became they become a parent, what, whatever that moment is that feels like a new beginning and helps you mark time. Like this is a new me. This is a new moment. That's when we're most motivated to begin fresh. And so if we're trying to encourage people to set big goals, to tackle new things at work, to, to take up training programs, those are moments when we probably want to encourage that. So I think that's useful to all, any leader. Indeed it is. It's very powerful because when I, when I read that and when I've just obviously listened to your, your illustration there and your story, I think some people I know would probably recognize certain moments you described, but I think if I look back at some of my, you know, some colleagues or some clients I work with, probably dismiss them and think, oh, well, you know, yeah, of course, the new, whether it's the new year job, whatever other moment. And actually, when I read it, I was, I was most intrigued saying, actually, no, this is the moment to actually try something new and, and, and obviously work on how, how to sustain it. So that, I, thought, I, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. I'm so glad. <laughs> I want to, I mean, there are some big strategic questions facing executives right now, if they've got an organization that's, you know, survived and is re financially resilient, um, not only about how they heal, help heal their people, um, if they can, uh, and also some questions about where they focus. But, you know, strategy is about choices. It's about winning, um, hopefully for a greater good, not just for shareholder value. Um, and it's encouraging people to change, change their mindsets to the way they act and perform in different ways. So in a sense, you're a strategist, of course, already by that definition. Um, what, would you, what would you say to, if you like, to a strategist considering choices? Is there any stimulus? Because I'm, I'm always fascinated. I sort of play it, dance around the academic world a little bit, you know, London Business School and other, other places. And, um, and I'm always fascinated with how, how and why sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. The OB, if you like, department, the organization yeah. behind the strategy departments don't, don't conjoin more than they do. So that's where I come from. What would, you yeah. what, what would you tell a strategist based on your, your research? I think um, one really important insight that applies to strategy and to individuals is um, that we're incredibly inertial. <laughs> uh, you know, I think I call this laziness in my book and actually try to explain why I think that's not an insult because it's very efficient. The most efficient operating systems and algorithms, they're very, you know, lazy. I'm a computer scientist by training. So like yes. the less energy, the less memory you use, the better. Uh, so I think of it as a compliment, but it has really important implications. Um, once you start down a path, it's very unlikely you'll veer off of it. You veer off of it too infrequently um, for, for your own good. And mm. that's true of individuals who are starting down paths. It's true of organizations and strategists. Uh, there's a phenomenon called escalation of commitment that I teach my students about each year. That's a sort of organizational disaster when it when it occurs or can be um, where you make a big investment in something and then because of inertia and because of sunk cost fallacy where you don't ignore the costs that are behind you and and irrecoverable and should be ignored you focus on you know I want to save face and I put so much into this let me put a little more in yes and uh, and you don't explore enough and recognize what's actually the optimal strategy moving forward so I think um, one big piece of advice would be 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 aware of that particular tendency um, and try to figure out, you know, are you doing something due to inertia? If you are, should you explore more? How can you pull yourself out of that yes. funk? And, and um, the book talks about how individuals can try to turn inertia into an advantage by sort of setting themselves up on inertial paths towards things that are good for them. And I think organizations can do that too. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. I mean, your book and your the initiative you co-direct I was obviously about societal change, of course, in terms of some of the big topics that you cover. And I know you've been vocal, at least when I read um, and listened to around some of the big societal change around, you know, the, you know COVID-19, vaccine taking and take up and so forth. As we, fingers crossed, based on the recording and the time of the recording now, we, we come out of the pandemic. It doesn't feel like that in the UK at the moment, given how we're living, but, we're, you know, we are coming out of the pandemic. Um, and if you were having a conversation with a political leader, I'm not asking you to get political, I know it's a delicate topic, but a political leader, <laughs> i.e. the societal level rather than at the business level. And they yeah. said, 
and you had that moment to give them some advice on some societal changes that you think that your your research and obviously captured in the book have a big impact on and you had two minutes maximum to tell them what would what would you say that's the meanest thing you can say to a professor. You have two minutes maximum. I just have to emphasize I that. get asked mean <laughs> questions by professors all the time, so this is my opportunity. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. In my two minutes, what would I tell them? Um, oh, my gosh. I think, uh, I think a really, really big lesson from this crisis that we've mm. been through mm. is um, that when we are trying to solve problems, whether it's climate change or um, a pan global pandemic or uh, trying to deal with um, crises in education, child poverty, you know, crime, you name it. Uh, there are so many crises we face. Mm. And a lot of them, we focus a, a lot of time and attention as we should on sort of hard science, right? So bench science, let's build the vaccines. We think a lot about supply chains, which yes. I've, my, my undergraduate degree is in operations research. And I sit in an operations department. I think supply chains are really important, but I think we, we forget about the human decision component too often right. at the right. end of that chain. And I think that happened with vaccines, which is one of the reasons my organization tried to step up and help think about that. Yes. Um, and that we need to recognize that human behavior is an obstacle in many occasions, on many occasions to great social outcomes and um, think about how we can be strategic, smart, how we can use the best science, how we can experiment and figure out what even better science might be to, to solve those problems and, and not neglect that behavioral sort of last mile. Hmm. That's a great answer. That is a great answer. I want to bring you back <laughs> you. to more comfortable territory, if you like, well, although you're comfortable in any, any territory, <laughs> I imagine. The world of academia. I'm fascinated as somebody sort of, as I said, dabbled in and around it on how you collaborate um, because I get the sense that you are pretty productive if that's that's probably an understatement um, you get through a lot and you do it very well you're collaborating all the time with academics who have different styles different schedules different priorities the paper you're researching may not be the, the their top priority um, so you're having to I guess influence and change may be too strong but change their behaviors all the time and I'll say this at risk it's just a private conversation, of course. Some, some professors and academics are more easy to manage, if you like, in terms of their style of working than others, um, if I put it Like mildly. all people, yes. We're, academia is full of characters, just like every other walk of life. <laughs> and the same is true, as I say, in, in business that I've worked in. How do you collaborate effectively? And how do you, with that other academics, as you do it day in, day out, and how do you encourage them to change using all the principles you've talked about? Yeah, actually... Um, a lot of the insights from my work come from, from successful collaborations. And I love that you asked that. And I will say that is one of the great joys of my career is getting to pick the incredible people I work with. It's such, it's such a treat to work with, with the people I get to work with. Um, okay. A couple of things. One, actually, there's a whole chapter in my book that talks about uh, how important it can be when the people you work with believe in you. So this insight, I, yes. I tell a story about my dissertation advisor, who is, um, he's named Max Bazerman. He's a professor at Harvard Business School. He might be the most successful academic advisor in the universe. That's, I'm sure that's an overstatement, but <laughs> in our field, there's no one who comes close to him. He has a family tree on his wall yes. that is yes. mind boggling. Uh, the, you know, his former students are professors at every top business school. It's, I mean, it's just an extraordinary. And literally, uh, like no one he's ever mentored has failed. <laughs> and, and I asked him when I was a, a student, um, I was, excuse me, when I was, when I was a fir an early stage professor, like, how do you do this? I'm starting to mentor my own students. I don't get it. What's your formula? And he didn't really have a very compelling answer. And what I realized later, and what I'm getting back to your question, I promise, because I, I think it helps me manage collaborations, mm -hmm. both of my own students who are often my collaborators and with others, uh, his magic was that he totally and completely trusted and believed in his students. He gave them mm, his, yes. you know, he, he made us feel like family. Um, there was no chance he would ever do the wrong thing by us. We were his top priority and he knew we were going to succeed. And so 
we believed we would succeed too. If this great yes. advisor, this mentor who was so well-known, if he said we, we were doing great, we were going to get a job, this paper was going to get into this journal, then it would. If yes. he thought we could turn around a revision in two weeks, he was right. And I think believing in the people you work with and showing them that you have that confidence in them, obviously you have to give them critical feedback sometimes too, yeah, but he sure. actually did that rarely. Instead, he often steered us in different ways. Um, he, he sort of showed his confidence in us. If there was something we were working on, maybe he would actually have us coach another student or work with another student on that. And that even showed us more how much he believed in us. Um, maybe we got the advice from someone else or we were giving advice sometimes and that helped mm -hmm. us learn things about ourselves and about what worked that we might not have, have reached or figured out if we had just been told. Um, so I think it's really important to think about what signals you're sending to the people you work with, yes. how to build their confidence. And then um, finally, and this has probably come out in what I've already said about how much I love my collaborators, but I'm lucky that I get to pick who I work with. I realize that's not true of everyone, but I try to pick people who I think are great fun to spend time with. And so it's truly a pleasure to work with these folks. So even if you have different, even if you have, you know, different working styles and so on, the fact that you get trust in each other, believe in each other, you can get through the moments where you go, come on, I've asked you to add your own section or do the revisions and so on as the, as the lead author. And then, and you haven't done anything for four weeks because you've been on a whatever sabbatical. Yeah, the point there's is patience as part yeah. of it, right? And um, <laughs> and there's under you have to know who's going to do what and sort of step in and and reassign and figure those things out. But but if you trust the people, you believe they're great mm -hmm. at what they do. You goes show them way. that you respect them. It goes a long way. If you pick people you really like working with and and it's fun and enjoyable, and so when when you hit uh, a wall, your um you know friendship is there and you'll figure it out um i think that's those very powerful it's very important. powerful yeah and sometimes assumed or understated you know in terms of because you focus on the task or the or the goal and you don't actually invest in the actual relationship and the dynamics between you i mean it, you talked a number of times about your your earlier earlier days um either as a grad student or as an early professor um if you had a new um phd student you were supervising if i'm getting the terminology right yeah. And she or he said to you uh, a very naive question. So it's my naivety, not theirs. They said, go on, tell me about the frontiers of behavioral science. What's on the, what's on the edge? I, the, we're not, not even, you know, it's beyond the book. It's beyond your research, the sort of frontiers. What would be the sort of themes and topics that you think that people listening and watching to this should be looking out for, or maybe even getting involved in? Yeah, such a great question. Um, I actually think that, uh, okay, there's, I have so many different answers. It's hard to know which one to pick, but um, I think one of the frontiers is what led me to start working, you know, full-fledged, fully focused in this area of behavior change was I realized we didn't know enough about behavior change that was truly durable um, and would last and last and last. And I went into this work hoping that we would sort of find a magic solution where you know you you deliver this treatment to someone you know you you give them a, a program for a month and then for the rest of their lives they're changed um and what i think we've mostly learned is most of the things you know most of the sort of light touch like digital things we can do for people if we let go after a month most people relapse yes and um two things i think uh one i was like too rosy eyed and optimistic and naive about the ability to come up with a magic potion that would change people forever and like doctors know this right they don't they don't treat diabetics for a month and then expect them to be cured like there's some things that are chronic like human nature and you expect that you need to keep delivering but uh but i think we don't know enough about how to do that well so mm -hmm. so once we accept that it was a ridiculous premise that we could <laughs> try to change people in a moment and sort of offer them some sort of digital program that would change their life um, forever. Then we have to say, well, what what would create lasting change? You know, I'm right. I wrote this book. I'm betting on knowledge, <laughs> and there's a lot of evidence that knowledge and education are one of the things that really do last and make a lasting change yes. in our lives because it changes the way we think. Um, but but I I think there's a lot of room for more research on what creates that kind of durable change, how we can stay with people, sustain them. Do we need to create variety? Um, 
Do we need long-term social relationships to be a part of the fabric of what works? And we have hints, you know, you can look at what, what happens in um, programming like Alcoholics Anonymous, for instance, and see what mm. lasts there. You can see that's a program that doesn't just let go after a indeed, month. Indeed. Um, but, but we need more science that's really, really rigorously testing and understanding what are the components, what are the pieces, what works, what backfires, what works for who. And, and so I think, I think I told you I was going to give you multiple answers. Instead, I'm just giving you a complex multi-part answer, but that's really what I'm still. I sort of expected by. that, but it's still clear. It's still clear. <laughs> hey, Katie, I mean, look, you are articulate, clearly passionate about the subject. You care about the impact, which is, you know, which I like as well, because the efficacy, if you like, or the impact of research sometimes it's not clear and it's more than just the you know the citation if you like you clearly focus on the end goal um you're also generous with people uh those who've who've supported you and now you are supporting them uh and also you're you know i get the impression you don't take yourself too seriously uh, as well so you're a regular person um your book is great i've i've read it uh it is stimulating um easy to read so it is accessible for people but also has some you know as you say, some contraire ideas and some really practical strategies that will help, I think, people in all walks of life. So I'm very, very, very grateful for, to speak to you today and, and um, to have you on my show. So thank you ever so much. Thank you for having me and for your very kind words. I'm so glad you enjoyed the book. And, Indeed. Um, it was really fun talking to you about it. Indeed it was. And hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. That was another edition of Lancefield on the Line.